in the Emerald Isle. Something unexplainable is happening. Tonight, prepare to witness the most frightening event in horror podcast history. A journey into the depths of horror history. First Class Horror presents The Class Horror Cast. Evil wears many masks, but pure horror wears only one. Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as one dollar. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you. William Lustig has been and still is a true fan and student of the movie business. He started his experience working behind the scenes in the adult film industry before working as a production assistant on movies such as Death Wish. In 1980, he burst onto the horror movie scene with the cult classic Maniac. From here, he took a detour from horror with the urban revenge movie Vigilante. He delivered another horror masterpiece in 1988 with Maniac Cop, and then followed up in 1990 with the even more successful sequel. He took on the trilogy movie but ultimately decided to walk away from the project, and his absence was certainly felt. His last outing as director was Uncle Sam, which was a great overlooked horror movie. From there he decided to work with Anchor Bay, producing DVD documentaries, and eventually started his own label, Blue Underground, which restores and re-releases popular and little scene cult classics and other grindhouse action drama and horror movies. We had the chance to talk about his journey, some lessons in both filmmaking and life, and some of his favourite moments. We also had a chance to peel back the curtain on what really went on behind the scenes of Maniac Tree. William is a fantastic mind in film and a true gent with a wealth of knowledge. I hope you guys enjoy this as much as I did. So, um, can you remember your first, I guess, first horror movie maybe you saw or first horror related experience? Um, I, the only thing I could think of is, um, You know, they used to play horror movies a lot on New York television. Mm -hmm. And I think that was probably my first horror experience. I don't think it was in the cinema. Right. Okay. But uh, if you were to ask me what I remember is my early experiences with horror. I remember going to see Hush Hush Sweet Charlotte Mm -hmm. and being and, and freaking out over the head rolling down the stairs and the guy at the beginning getting, you know, Bruce Stern getting his, his, uh, you know, hand cut off and his head cut off and all that stuff. And would you say that, um, did you, was that a, like, what kind of age was that, I guess? Well, look up, I saw it when it was first released. So whatever the year is, I would say it was probably, I want to say early sixties. And did you develop a love for it after that? Um, I, 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 you know, honestly, I, 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 I don't remember. I don't, I don't have a sense of when I ha- fell in love with horror. You know, there wasn't like a, a pivotal moment or a, an epiphany or something where all of a sudden, aha, I love horror. You know, I loved every I loved movies. You know, I loved all kinds of movies. I loved the James Bond films, the World War Two adventure films growing up, you know, the movies like The Dirty Dozen, Kelly's Heroes, all those films. And, you know, I was pretty well rounded. I I I, I would say I, I started to become more immersed in horror probably in the late 60s. <laughs> Excuse me. I became more immersed with horror, I think, after seeing Bird with the Crystal Plumage, which I think was 1969, because I was really impressed by that movie and and the fear that it evoked. Um, so, OK, so from there, 
did you okay so would you say from that point like a lot of people who have maybe experiences with horror especially they kind of um they also have stories of things like uh, maybe being a collector of something whether it be um i'm not sure like comics or toys and stuff like that actually i never collected comics or toys but i did collect soundtrack albums and the and i remember purchasing the imported uh, lp of the soundtrack for burr with the crystal plumage which soundtrack i used on one of my early student films oh wow yeah yeah yeah, I, I was so like impressed a... with that Morricone soundtrack. Oh God, it was so great. Still is, of course. It's um, it's strange. Well, not, I guess not strange, but there always seems to be a little bit of a correlation there between, um, you know, people being into movies and stuff, and then maybe also being a collector. You know, whether it be, um, a movie collector, uh, vinyl soundtracks, you know, whatever it might be. Normally, people kind of have something. Yeah, mine was definitely uh, soundtracks. I was really big on buying LPs. They were like a souvenir for me of the movie. And um, is that something that carried through life for you? Or did you just kind of... I, I, I collected a lot of CDs. When I would go to uh, Europe, I would purchase a lot of CDs and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it continued. Um, I don't do as much well you know what i do do some not as not as much as before maybe because i got all the ones i really like mm-hmm. uh but um yeah i mean i still occasionally i buy soundtracks and things like that it's um it's insane to see how much vinyl has kind of come back around now <laughs> yeah but i don't have a i don't have a turntable and i have no desire to run out and buy one i'm okay with cds yeah, I like I had a huge CD collection and then somebody, I think somebody bought me a vinyl as a gift and it just kind of, I only have a small collection of vinyl, but so many horror movies now get these really cool like collector's mm-hmm. vinyls and I think. It, oh, I know. Yeah. And like for yeah, a lot of people, no, it becomes I, more collecting that I think than actually even listening to the, to the, the record. I itself. think so. Yeah. I think they look at it as, uh, you know, for collecting. Yeah, no, I, I think some of the, I mean, I've had some nice vinyls come out on, on soundtracks for my movies. Mm-hmm. Beautiful vinyls. Yep. Um, okay, so at what point then would you say that you started to shift towards um, wanting to work in the movie business? And when did that really you know, I would say to... it was, it was, yeah, I, I would say it was around the same time, the late 60s. Um, I was, um, this is before I was in high school. I, I really had this desire to make movies. I was just in love with movie, you know, with the whole idea of making movies. I used to go to the public library and read books on the making of films, you know, and, and books about Hitchcock and Frank Capra and technical books. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember going, I, I don't even know. Uh, why I did this, but I had the, I had the, uh, chutzpah, there's an expression, uh, to go to a camera rental place in New York and ask to kind of learn how to use the equipment. And they were very accommodating. I mean, there I was probably 14, 15 years old, wanting to learn how to use camera equipment. And they actually... They they allowed it or whatever and showed you and let you. Yeah, well, they were showing me. They were, you know they didn't let me take the, the the cameras out, but they were showing me in there. And I don't know. I think they were kind of surprised that I that I showed such an interest. And I was just going to say, I guess um, a lot of people probably don't shoot their shot and attempt to maybe ask or put themselves out there. So. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, I, I, I think these places think in the long term. They see somebody interested today or passionate today is going to be the DP, you know, ten years from now. That's going to rent is going to be responsible for renting equipment from the place. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, can you remember maybe some of your first jobs when when it started to feel like the the dream was real? Maybe. 
Well, uh, my the first job I had was uh, as a production assistant on a uh, adult movie mm-hmm. called Hit Neurotica, mm-hmm. and I worked on that. Um, then, uh, and then after that, I worked, uh, as a production assistant on a movie called across 110th street. Mm-hmm. And then I started working in, in editing. You know, I was, I was working as an unpaid apprentice editor at a place. Again, I wanted to learn how to use the equipment. I wanted to learn technical stuff. And one of the, um, early jobs I had were sinking dailies. For movies like uh, Death Wish and The mm-hmm. Longest Yard and The Gambler, all these movies, I would, I would, you know, sync the dailies. That's where you, um, you would sync the picture and the sound. And um, I guess was was the intention always to start to direct at some point? Yes, yeah. I was always. I always was thinking of directing. I want to be a director. I want to be a director. Mm. You know, and I got little, you know, um, I got I got moments during the uh, especially, you know, in the adult business, mm-hmm. you know, where everything is very, um, I, I, you know, it's not super professional as far as the, you know, the the, the etiquette of making the movies is um, I would get chances to go out and shoot scenes. Not the adult scenes, but the stuff that they really didn't care about, which was the scenes that bridged the adult scenes. And and do you feel like that maybe gave you a good, I mean, I guess experience in a way to be able to... Every, do you know, I still learn to this day. I'm always, mm-hmm. there's never a time, this is the great part about the business that I'm in. I never stopped learning. And yeah, I mean, I know I learned from adult movies, probably a lot more about the technical aspects because I was allowed hands-on experience with the equipment uh, in a real situation. Um, You know, it it, it was, you know, I was learning how to load 35 millimeter cameras, work a Nagra, all this, all this equipment. So that, you know, when I went out to make, my early adult films, I had had this great um, experience, a practical, real life experience, and um, which I know helped, you know, helped me later when I went to do, you know, when I went to do Maniac, mm-hmm. because I had amassed a lot of experience. A lot of people who make early horror films don't necessarily have any background. You know, practical background. They may have gone to school or whatever, but they don't really have a practical background like I did. So when I went to do Maniac, I was already pretty technically proficient. And do you find, um, do you think that's something that maybe everybody should do, where they kind of dip their toe in a lot of different aspects of the business to gain as much experience across the board? Well, if they intend to be a director... You have to understand everybody's job. You may not be able to do it, you know, as well as they, but you got to understand it. You got to understand the challenges of a sound man, the cameraman, the editors. You know, you you really need to understand. You have to have a full picture, mm-hmm. or don't bother directing. It's not going to work. So, you know, okay. So to answer your question would be yes. Yeah. Yeah, cause, and I and I've actually heard that a lot more. Um, a couple of different people I've spoken to and stuff had mentioned, um, you know, attempting to understand different aspects that maybe it gives you a clearer picture because you get a full scope of why everybody's there. You know, the the pressure, the whatever is going on. Um, so no doubt about it. So you done. You done some um, adult movies, and then at what point then did it? So you went straight from I think was it Hot Honey? Yeah, I, I think Hot Honey was eighty eight, and the other one was not eighty eight, seventy eight. What am I saying? Seventy eight, and the first one was in seventy seven. That was the uh, the violation of Claudia. Yeah, and I know I started shooting Maniac in seventy nine. So it was like the year after Hot Honey, basically. Yeah. And and how did that come about then? How did you make the switch from that 
to to me. Well, it was always my intention. I wanted to make a horror film. Mm -hmm. I really wanted to make a horror film. I mean, I was I was making adult films and I was doing the best I could, but it really didn't. I wasn't passionate about it. There were some directors who made those films who did better than I did, who were super passionate about the subject. Mm -hmm. I really wasn't. I mean, keep in mind, I was 21 years old. Uh, you know, I, I really wasn't that, you know, uh, you know, sexually experienced to the extent that some of the some of the co colleagues that I was, uh, you know, I, I, that were going out making films at the same time who were like, you know, 10, 20 years older than me. Mm -hmm. And so, like, how did Maniac then fall on your lap as regards um, obviously you've you've got this goal you want to get to this point how does it all sort of um how does everything come together to get you there well um it didn't fall on my lap i was trying to make a horror film right after doing violation of claudia mm -hmm. yeah i had met joe spinell when i worked as a production assistant on, on a movie called the seven ups mm -hmm. and joe was playing a thug and he and I kind of hit it off because we were both horror fans. And he went off and started, you know, he was continuing with his career. He was a very active actor. And um, but we kept in, in contact about making a horror film. And um, uh, I mean, that was our goal. You know, he would call me from Italy while he's making Star Crash and and, um, you know, we st I, I started working on we worked on one script that we abandoned and then we worked on another one. And uh, slowly we were able to mold a script for the movie Maniac, what became Maniac. And um, Joe had an acting window of opportunity and we, had, we were unable to raise money. Nobody would give me money. You know, they think you could do a porno. Can you do a horror film? You know, mm -hmm. you're almost better asking for money to do a horror film when you've never done anything else. Yeah. And so I, um, you know, hat in hand, going around trying to raise money. I got so frustrated. But I had a, uh, I had amassed a small fortune of thirty thousand dollars from doing those early adult films. And Joe was working on the movie Cruising, and my boyhood friend Andrew Garoni had some money he had uh, uh, amassed. And so with a grand total of 30000 12000 from Andy Garoni and 6000 from Joe Spinell, $48,000 in the bank, we went out and started shooting Maniac. That That's – and it just goes to show um, the – I guess the – determination and stuff that you guys had to because i would imagine to have thirty thousand dollars especially back then um it probably wasn't necessarily something that you wanted to i don't want to say give up but th maybe the confidence that you had that you wanted to do this that you were willing to put in well you know what i tell people in film class mm -hmm. the beauty of being young is being fearless now, some people do that by, you know, driving cars too fast, drinking too much, taking too many drugs. You know, you 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 but, you know, that, you know, whatever, whoever made us gave us a, a, a fearless gene when we're young that begins to fade off as we get older. So it never occurred to me. Even, you know, with I also forgot to tell you, I also, during the production, maxed out my credit cards, took unsecured loans from oh, bank, wow. from a bank, a small loan. I was, you know, I was doing everything to keep the movie moving forward. And so it never, it, it just never felt like failure was an option. It's hard to explain, but I think when you're young, you just don't think about that. Mm -hmm. Maybe in, in, in somebody looking, you know, you know, looking in on what we did, you know, they would say, oh, boy, this is technically foolish. But I didn't feel that way. I mean, it worked out. It worked out great. It worked out perfect. Yeah, it worked out really yeah, good. Yeah, I mean, it, was, it couldn't have been better. But, you know, there was a risk. But I never thought of it. It just... 
You know, it's funny. It felt inevitable. Now, did I expect Maniac to become a classic that we'd be talking about it, what, 45, how many years later, 40 mm-hmm. years later or something? You know, we're still talking about the movie. And um, no, I, I could, I would, no, straight out, I never thought it was a classic. Joe Spinell would tell me we're making a classic. Yeah. I just said, I'm going to get my money back by playing 42nd Street in Texas Drive-Ins. And how do you, like, so looking back now, well, I mean, I guess you've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but how do you, how do you feel about that movie now? So, you know, it's, it's been so long now and for, I mean, in my opinion, it, it just seems year on year with this. Um, it it's kind of gained more of a following and it's become more of a cult classic and it seems to be talked about more. Well, you know what I'm surprised about? And I, and, and I hope this comes off the right way. When I was doing the 4K remaster of the movie mm-hmm. and we were dealing with uh, now the original 16 millimeter negative, because mm-hmm. all along all we transferred from was a 35 blow up negative. So now I'm looking at the movie, you know, the 16 negative, which was really crisp and um, and colorful. And I'm looking at the movie and I'm going, you know, this is a pretty well made movie. <laughs> I, I looked at it. And I go, you know, I, I think I kind of knew something about what I was doing, because mm-hmm. I often think when I think back at Maniac, I, I look at it as a exercise in instincts. I didn't think of it so much. I didn't think it through. I didn't I didn't intellectualize it. I just went out wanting to make the as scary a movie as possible. And um and uh I was I look at it and I go, you know, this is not a bad movie. <laughs> this is you know, it's got some good things. There are things I would change, of course. But, you know, I, I looked at it by and large. I said, gee, you know, the wonder it kinda holds up. Yeah, I mean, and and I feel the same, and I know a lot of people do, and even like um, the sense of grittiness that you kind of get from the movie, and um, you know, I think about maybe thirty minutes into the movie when we start to see him alone at times. Um, it it's just, and I, I don't mean this to sound, um, I don't mean this in a bad way, but it's uh, kind of, I don't want to say a miracle, but. I know you had experience previous to this, but it's like you come right out the gate with a movie like that. It's like crazy. It seems like one in a million, really. I guess I was the luckiest guy in the world. I was 24 years old when I made it, and I guess I was very lucky. I mean, I think a lot of it as well comes down to passion and stuff. You can definitely tell that there was... um, and it's interesting to hear you say maybe that you didn't get in your head too much and you just let things kind of definitely do what they were going to do. Yeah. And by the way, when I was making the film, I was periodically told that behind my back, the crew didn't think I knew what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And I always I, it was just weird because, you know, I, I just I, I ignored it because I just was doing what I felt I was doing, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I, I later learned that everybody on a set wants to be the director. And because it's, you know, really your first legitimate film, they, they're kind of jealous and they all think they could do it better than you. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it was, I was very lucky. How, um, have you, I guess, carried that attitude with you your whole life, like up to this point of maybe, um, I guess nowadays with, with social media and all these different things, like we spoke earlier about Instagram, um, a lot of people become so obsessed and so invested that they, um, I guess, allow negative things to take over and maybe a little bit of imposter syndrome, feeling like they shouldn't be in the position they're in or they shouldn't do a certain thing because of what, I guess, the audience are saying or the naysayers might say well i think if i was a a, a filmmaker today um i would probably i probably would be driven crazy by social media 
it just I, I never it's like the same a maniac if you notice it doesn't say a film by William Lustig or a William Lustig film it was just I always thought the director served the audience not mm -hmm. the other way around so I always thought that I you know I kept myself in the shadows I didn't I didn't you know I did you know some interviews for Fangoria magazine but I never looked at uh, being a director as being a, a celebrity. I always thought it was somebody who was, you know, no different than the grips and the, you know, and the cameraman, you know, that it was a blue collar job that you went out to make the best movie you can make. And and, uh, and I think a lot of people now kind of some of them, at least I've, I've heard of think of themselves as instant Fellinis. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So when when the movie came out, then, uh, what was the reception like for you? And, um, I guess did, like did business pick up, or was the phone ringing constantly? Like, how was it in the aftermath no. of the movie coming out? No, I, I um when the film came out, it was a well. First thing is we screened it at Cannes, mm -hmm. and it and it, and it just was from that first screening in Cannes. There was buzz about Maniac and people just bought it up in every country in the world. So we went into Cannes, you know, with, you know, being <laughs> essentially broke. I think we I think I got a diner's club card so we could pay for the tickets or something. And uh, and we came out with like a million over a million dollars really in foreign sales on the movie. And then we come to this country and we start showing it around and. Um, and, you know, all the studios rejected it, which I expected, but we had to show it to them anyway. And, you know, and then, you know, there was definitely interest in the movie. And then when the film was released, I mean, it was doing boffo business in, uh, you know, in the places it was playing. So, you know, I, I was, again, very lucky. And OK, so and at that point, then had you already got something in mind for what was to come next or yes i didn't want to do another horror film but i wanted to make an action film uh modeled after the italian action films that i love mm -hmm. and uh you know the enzo castellari the uh umberto lenzi movies uh, that's the kind of movie i wanted to make and um and that's vigilante i made vigilante and um yeah and, and and what i guess what made you because i hear a lot of people say that as well they they come out and make a horror movie maybe and then initially straight after don't really want to make another would sooner maybe move away a bit and then maybe come back at some point in the future well i always loved horror and i wasn't ashamed if a great horror script had had fallen into my lap i would have jumped at it mm -hmm. and i was offered opportunities to make a sequel or you know to maniac and all this and i didn't want to do it i i just wanted to do something different i wanted to do something fresh for me just so i exercise other muscles and that's why i did vigilante i thought we had a pretty good idea for a story and um and i wanted to do it in the style of uh um, the Italian movies. I even put in a little Sergio Leone in there. And did it did it live up to maybe the vision you had? Were you happy with the with the movie? I would. I'm. I'm probably. There. How can I say this? Um, I don't want to. A lot of people really, really, really like Vigilante. I get a lot of positive mm -hmm. response on the movie, but for me, my. Uh, disappointment with the film is I think I needed to um, how could I put it there was there was scenes in the film that felt very talky and I think we could have I don't know cut some of that down or I could have found a more interesting way to shoot them um, I don't know I, I look at it and it, and it feels um almost there but not mm -hmm. quite entirely and i had an idea for an ending to the movie 
And I don't know if it entirely works for the audience because the films, a lot of people say, gee, the movie abruptly ended. But I always had this idea that and I I didn't I didn't really know how to punctuate the end of the film. I just had in mind. Do you remember the movie with James Cagney? I'm a fugitive from the chain gang. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that movie? The end of the film. Um, was that James Cagney, who was a really straight laced and, you know, really honest guy and, you know, and but he gets fucked over and he's sent on a chain gang and all this kind of stuff. So by the end of the film, he's so infuriated. He's like really frazzled. His brain is frazzled by all that he's gone through. And I kind of wanted that to be Robert. That he yeah. had just thrown a guy off a roof, chased him through streets, you know, he, and now he's blown up a judge. And I kind of had this idea of that he's James Cagney at the end of I Am a Fugitive from a Chain Gang as he drives off in his van. But I don't think I really made that work. You know, I, I needed – I, maybe I needed a line of dialogue from him, or maybe it was the direction I gave him and his look and everything. But I wanted this idea that here's this here here is what society has created is taking this hardworking blue collar guy and turned him into a killing machine. Yeah, and I, I'm another person you could add to that list that loves that movie. Um, it, it, it seems like you know when you look over some of your movies a lot of them um not to say that they weren't successful at the time but like a lot of these movies have really stood the test of time um especially you know getting re-released and stuff and getting collector's editions and different things like that like in a way they kind of feel maybe more relevant now than maybe they were back then you know, that's up to the audience to conclude. I, I just um, I'm just happy that they're that the re-release of these movies have gotten contemporary reviews, many of whom had never seen the film. The critics have never seen it, mm -hmm. who will really give me some, you know, very good reviews. And so uh, Vigilante came out in 82, 82 or 83, was it? I think it was 83 when it came out. I think we finished it in 82. And so from that point then, um, your next movie would have been Maniac Cop, right? Right. Well, <laughs> here's what happened. I, I started developing scripts that were underwhelming in the end. That's one of the problems, you know, not everything you write, uh, turns out to be something that's worth raising money and shooting. Mm -hmm. You look at it and you say, you know, this doesn't quite work. <laughs> and um, and I don't know how to really fix it. Maybe it was just a bad idea to start with. So I went through that that scenario. And then I, I realized being based in New York was a detriment to my ability to raise money from the video companies who were the main – funders of films at that time here i was in 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 new york uh, and you know i should really be out in la uh meeting with these people like vestron and media home entertainment and you know some of these other companies and um so i was kind of out of the the, the uh the uh, out of the loop as far as you know getting financing and um Anyway, to make a long story short, I hook up with Larry Cohen, and uh, he asked me why I never did a sequel to Maniac. I told him I didn't think you know, a sequel really was warranted, and uh, we were brainstorming over lunch, and he came up with, well, you know, uh, what about Maniac Cop? You know, at the time, there was Beverly Hills Cop, there was uh, uh, RoboCop, and he said, what about a Maniac Cop? And I said, holy shit, that's a great title. <laughs> and that, you know, kind of started the Maniac Cop ball rolling. It's kind of even, even just to hear you say that, um, the story of you guys at lunch and, and you kind of bring someone to come up that idea. I even felt that right there now of like, holy shit, that like, 
how that kind of spawned that idea. Um, yeah. And it's a movie that e- even I feel um, gets more and more respect and more and more, it, it's maybe pushed out there more. Um, like a lot of the younger generation seem to know Maniac Cop now. And in a way it kind of sits there. Like you'll, you, I guess you will always have your Freddy Krueger, Jason Voorhees, those kind of guys. But I feel like Maniac Cop sits like right beneath those, like maybe two or three huge titles. Um, well, and more and more you. so, even with Arrow Video and stuff re-releasing them, it's uh it's really given them a new life. And especially over, I mean, I'm in Ireland, so especially Ireland, the UK, and Europe, I see a lot of. Even in Spain, Spain has quite a big um, movie following, and yeah, but they steal it all. (laughs) (laughs) I see them trying to. I don't know how it works, but they do. They get a lot of weird releases that I don't see anywhere else in the world, and I'm not sure if they're official or not. Um, Yeah, that's a good way to put it. (laughs) (laughs) Because it's only something that I realized um, a couple of months after buying these things, and I'm like, wait a second, I don't think this is an actual an actual release. <sighs> That's um, the problem with Spain. But, okay, so you, so you get this idea for Maniac Cop. Um, you've got the title. So from there, then, you guys develop the story. And well, actually, Larry went off. Um, well, let me just tell you, it's kind of funny. We, we came up with the idea in February. Mm-hmm. The next month is March, and that's... Uh, where they have the St. Patrick's Day parade in New York. Mm-hmm. And we and, and Larry and I both uh, felt that the St. Patrick's Day parade would have to play some role in this movie. We didn't even have an idea. We didn't have a story. We didn't have anything. Mm-hmm. I, we just – it was just – we got to shoot some St. Patrick's Day footage to use in our movie Maniac Cop. So – I, I'm in New York. Larry's in L.A. and he types up some some script pages um, where you know that's what Sam Raimi read on uh, as a news reporter. Yeah, he, he's re- and we he's mentioning characters that we have yet to know who they are, what they're doing, how they relate, and so that really was like we you know he wrote this stuff and. We, you know, we came up with that idea. Well, we should we want to have Bruce Campbell star on the movie. And maybe what we should do is he's running through the parade looking for, you know, the maniac cop. We wound up not using the footage, but, you know, we figured we'd get some background footage. We'd get some, you know, some footage of the parade with Sam Raimi tying it all in because Sam was in New York at the time waiting to, for the money to come up to come through for uh, Dark Man. Mm-hmm. So he's in New York waiting. I think he was staying at some girl's house and he was waiting for the money for Dark Man. And I said, oh, come on, Sam, let's go out and shoot this. And um, yeah, so that was it. And then uh, Larry went off. And he, 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 you know, started working on the script. Uh, I uh, uh, met with uh, James Glickenhaus. It was just, again, a lunch in New York. This was in April. Mm-hmm. I, he asked me what we're doing because we had shared offices together, Jim and I. And we were friends. You know, we were friends before that. And I said, well, I'm working on a project with Larry Cohen called Maniac Cop. Maniac Cop? Oh, that sounds great. And uh, he says, uh, I'm, I'm about to go into partnership with uh, a guy by the name of Lenny Shapiro. And um, I, 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 how much do you think the film would cost? I said a million dollars. And, um, you know, I was pretty right. The film wound up costing about a million two hundred thousand. And um and he put up the money, you know, God bless Jim. He uh, put up the money and uh, left us alone. And when you had that conversation with him, um, how much of the story did you either know to give him? I didn't know anything. It was just basically off the title Maniac Cop. Yeah, it was off the Maniac Cop. He didn't even ask to read a script. 
That's crazy. It's, I mean, it, it, well, he it knew worked me. out really it wasn't good. Like I was unknown, it wasn't like I was an unknown entity. You know, he knew me, knew me for many years, so he trusted me. And eventually he got a script, you know, and I guess he could have pulled the plug if he didn't like it. Mm-hmm. I guess but he again, probably, we had com- <laughs> were you, um, were you, I, I guess you were probably enthusiastic and kind of behind this project. So he could probably read from you. This was a good, bet. exactly. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I think, well, first he was forming a company and these are the kind of movies that they needed to, you know, they needed to fund movies like this for the company. So he had a need for product, but he was also looked at Larry Cohen and Bill Lustig. I've known Bill for, you know, for, you know, I think at that point we knew, knew each other for at least five, six or more years. And so it was a no brainer. And um, so at what point then does Larry come back to you? Is everything fully completed and fleshed out by the time the, maybe you're back talking about well, actually making this I, thing? Well, we signed the deal with Shapiro Glickenhaus. My recollection, we signed the deal and we started pre-production on the movie in July. This is all the same year. And Larry had delivered me a draft of the script in June. And we were um, uh, we were revising the script um, and all that. And uh, I mean, we were, the, the script was in a constant revision, not in a big sense where we're rewriting everything, but as I found locations and, you know, and we were, and I hired a stunt man and we were talking about, well, what if we try this? What if we try that? You know, mm-hmm. this, this script changed. It was fluid. It was fluid. In fact, the entire ending had changed on it, you know, but it was essentially the same. It was the same story beats, but done differently. Mm-hmm. And, for Maniac Cop himself, did you guys, um, I guess, have a vision for exactly how he'd look? Or did you have somebody in mind? Or was Robert always that Robert guy? Was, Robert, in my mind, was always that guy. For Larry Cohen, it wasn't the same. You know, so we met with people and and Larry had in his mind, maybe we should get somebody who's a dancer who can move around. I said, no, it's got to be big and scary and, you know, and all this. But, in, you know, what's so funny is I kept fluctuating in my mind. Who is man? Maniac cop. Is he a zombie? Mm-hmm. Is he someone who was, you know, who's come back from the dead? That was, you know, or is he somebody who you know, is, is still alive, you know? And, um, I, I, I couldn't quite put in my head what I, I, I had a, tr- I had trouble settling on who's maniac cop. <laughs> I mean, that went on probably throughout the entire movie. <laughs> and so when you decide, like who decided it was Robert or how did you get around? You said Larry was kind of I not just sure. said, I, Larry, I think he's the guy. He's the guy. You know, I was the director. Larry really wasn't the producer. I was the producer director. Larry's name as producer was because, you know, he was working for less money than he had gotten paid on other projects. So he he wanted a producer credit as a perk. Mm -hmm. But he didn't produce it. I produced it. And uh, so, uh, you know, it was my final decision. And what was it about Robert that drew you to him as the character? I saw Robert in a movie called Night Stalker, mm-hmm. very little known film uh, where he played the killer in that movie. And I found him in that film to be very frightening. Mm-hmm. So and and I just thought he'd be perfect. Yeah, he really he's one of those characters that now I look at as like he is that character. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just he. I'm not sure how to explain it, but he doesn't feel very interchangeable. Um, I've tried to imagine, I've seen people online, um, you know, people do fun things where they'll recast a movie and replace people with different actors. And he's just one of those, those people I kind of struggle to not see his face and see him in that. Yeah. Um, No, he was, he was great. Was it, was it well received when the movie came out? Was there a lot of buzz? 
The film was was extremely well received overseas. Mm-hmm. Uh, right off of a promo reel, uh, Shapiro Glickenhaus was able to recoup uh, the cost of the production. Wow. And I hadn't finished the film yet. But he, here's where the story gets funny. They went to a film festival at that time called Milan. Mm-hmm. Now, I had shot the movie in August and finished it sometime in September. But um, this film festival in Milan uh, is in October. So they wanted a promo reel to be cut so they could exhibit it and try selling the movie. Mm -hmm. And we cut the promo reel and, you know, and uh, and they went over there. They sold the movie, recouped the budget. And so everybody was it was sort of a the movie they didn't. How can I put it? They didn't really care about the movie at that point because it wasn't in trouble. Mm-hmm. If that makes any sense. They yeah. didn't have like a risky investment or anything. So um, I uh, and one of the things is I always under promise. So when they would ask me, even before they went to Italy, they said, how's the movie? I said, I think it's OK. I think it's going to work. You know, I would I would say things like this because I didn't want to get their expectations up high. Mm-hmm. Anyway, when I finally finished the movie, there was a private screening uh, for the two executives at Shapiro Glickenhaus. Um, and we we're in a theater in Hollywood, a private theater. And I'm there with the editor and we're sitting like 10 rows behind them. And we show the movie. I don't hear anything. And at the end of the movie, both both of the guys bolt out the door. They don't say a word to me. And I'm going, what the fuck? <laughs> they they hate the movie that much? You know, they don't say a word to me? You know, that they think I stole the money? What What is wrong with these people? So I follow them out to the parking lot. I catch up with them. And, um, and the guy who did the foreign sales on the movie turns to me, his face is beat red, um, a British guy, by the way, uh, beat red is, and he turns to me, and goes, why didn't you tell us this movie was going to be that good? <laughs> and then he starts rattling off all the territories they sold and how much they could have gotten had they waited to show the movie. Like they said, well, we, 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 we did Germany. We got 150,000. We could have gotten 300,000 if we had, you know, and, and then he tell he goes to Japan. He tell, go, goes through all the territories they sold on the movie, you know, pissed off that they, they had undersold the movie. So. When it came to the U.S., it was like, how can I explain it? Their enthusiasm for the movie, you know, there was no real upside because they were kind of locked into these agreements. So they didn't give it a full-fledged promotion when they re- when the film was released. They only did what they needed to do in order to satisfy a video deal that they had made. And, um, and <laughs> That's uh, what happened. So it didn't. The first movie was was successful despite the distributor. It got sold to HBO. It got sold, you know, to other places. But it was really overseas where the film caught fire. That's where it got the most enthusiasm was overseas, which is why the second movie was financed by a British company. Yeah. So that that was something I was going to ask about. So. Obviously, maybe, um, you know, the public or it wouldn't it it probably wasn't mainstream knowledge that this was going on. But I would imagine within the circles, then would people have heard this? Mm, Other companies I don't know. or anybody like would, would that have no. been a known thing? No, no. Um, well, you know, here's the thing. When the film got released on video. Mm-hmm. The company that put it out, it was a it was a company called Transworld Entertainment. Mm-hmm. It was their absolute number one selling movie of all time. Wow. They shipped like uh, something like 86,000 units of the movie on VHS, which at that time sold for like $50 each. It was a huge success for them. In fact, that's why they financed a movie called Psycho Cop. Yeah. <laughs> Anything to try and live off the coattails. Yeah. 
And the thing is, is, you know, it's weird, but and, and, and sad at the same time, because I considered the people at the company to be friends of mine. But it was weird because the maniac cops success became an embarrassment because they had undersold the foreign, mm -hmm. you know, they had done this video deal in the U.S. So, and you know, they were like really, you know, kind of annoyed, you know, that I, I think also it's why they started their own video label uh, after the after Maniac Cop, because they were, you know, they were annoyed they undersold the picture. It's, it's crazy to hear that that story went that way. It's it's it was just a really odd experience because it was egos and embarrassment and and, you know, sometimes maybe I rubbed a little salt in it. You know, I was young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you know, <laughs> I realize in retrospect that might not have been too smart. But when it came to doing the sequel, these guys were like, you know, oh, well, the first was success. But how can they make a sequel to the movie, you know? And remember, at the time, sequels were always considered to be inferior to the original. Mm -hmm. And um, so – they declined to go forward with the sequel, so the rights reverted to Larry and I, and this company in England wanted to do a sequel and was willing to fund it. So that, that was uh, – that's what we did. That seems crazy to me that um, they were so bitter over – or whatever uh, – over the fact that the first one – it's kind of a uh, – I guess maybe a weird battle for them in their mind of like something was so successful, but we undersold it. So now I actively kind of nearly don't want it to do as good. I don't know. It's complicated because it was successful for the companies that bought it very well. By way of example, they licensed France for 50,000. Mm -hmm. The British company was able to license France for 500,000. Wow. So you get a sense of the success the film had, mm -hmm. That's you know, that they were able amazing. to get. I mean, the first film was licensed to Japan for like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Shapiro Glickenhaus, one hundred and fifty thousand. The British company licensed it for eight hundred thousand sequel. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And so did you guys know when you got the rights back, did you guys know that? Okay, we've got something now. We can really, we can really go with this. Well, I was more concerned about making a sequel because, again, again as I said, nine out of ten sequels suck, mm -hmm. and so I was worried about doing a sequel. I was worried that it just wouldn't live up to the first one and all of that. So I had this determination, you know, and uh, that it wouldn't suck. Larry delivered a really good script. And I saw a script that I could run with. Mm -hmm. So I felt like, you know, 75% is, is already done. You know, that the script had a good, you know, it had a good structure, good characters, and I can really run with this. You know, it's it's always, again, as I said, it's always fluid. You change things as you go along. But I saw that it fundamentally was a good script mm -hmm. and had some wonderful scenes. And um, so with, uh, uh, you know, so with this British company, I wanted to, you know, get a bigger budget. And um, ultimately, we wound up with a four million dollar budget. And um, so I was able to get, you know, some bigger names in the film and, um, you know, go bigger with the scope of it, the stunts, all that stuff. I was able to really, really ramp it up. And all I kept saying while I'm making the movie to myself is this can't suck. This can't mm -hmm. suck. It's got to be bigger and better than the first one. <laughs> that was that was my my mantra to myself. Maybe I shared it with some people at the time, but it was things, something that kept going on in my head. And and when the movie was finished, did you um, 
did you feel like you had achieved that? Yes. Yeah. You yeah. felt it, and it, like even before the movie had released. Well, I mean, before the first screening of the film was in Cannes, mm-hmm. uh, at, at a huge theater in Cannes, not the Palais, but the um, I think it's called the Olympia, mm-hmm. and um, and they screened it there. And uh, uh, I mean, I just the audience just went crazy. They went crazy for the film. But it's so funny. The guys from Shapiro Glickenhaus were at the screening. And one of the guys says to me, the first one was still better. (laughs) As he's walking out of the theater, I'm there gloating, you know, with a big smile on my face. I think these guys felt depressed that they gave up doing the sequel. (laughs) Yeah, I can only imagine. (laughs) And and he says to me, oh, the first one was better. <laughs> just anything to try and rub salt in a wound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and they're gloating and they're hearing everybody in the theater. They're all happy. They applauded, I think, at the end. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So, is that kind of when you know you've got something? At that, like, you really have, like, I, okay, we've got no, the but I knew I, I knew I had something when I was mixing the sound on the movie. Okay, I knew I had something when the music came in and, you know, when you're seeing all the elements, you know, mm-hmm. come together. I said, this movie's working. It's working. I felt very confident about that movie. And I mean, I guess like it, at least in my opinion, anyway, I know you had explained um, some of the things that went on behind the scenes, but I would have considered Maniac Cop, a, you know, very successful and then you bring out this sequel and like you said up until that point and even still nowadays um a lot of sequels are seen as inferior and then you have this sequel that gets a really good reception and things seem to be going really well did you straight away think we've got to make this a trilogy or no in fact i didn't really want to make a third movie (laughs) I was happy the way it ended. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought it was a really good ending. And I, you know, I really, yeah, did I leave it open? Of course I did. But I, it, it, it was closed enough that I felt we've given it everything. Yeah. And um, and I was off again looking uh, to make a movie. Um, I had come across a script that I really liked. And I optioned and uh, I started working on it. And... Uh, I spent two years uh, working on this project and I got replaced as the director and uh, it was very disheartened. And in the meantime, there's a company that wants to do a third maniac cop. And, you know, a director is not a director if he doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I uh, agreed to do it. But it was not something I, I really, really wanted to do. And and did you feel that kind of from the get go that maybe you, your heart wasn't? Oh no yours? doubt. Oh yeah, my heart wasn't in it. But there were some interesting things in Larry's script that I thought I could do something with, and then it all got gutted because the the script that Larry had written had replaced Robert Davi's character with a black detective, mm-hmm. and the movie was set in New York City's Harlem at a hospital, at a, at a hospital that we, that we knew existed. It was an abandoned hospital in, um, in Harlem. And, uh, you know, that I, we felt it would be a really good setting. And we had exteriors that were around it that we thought we could use. And um, it was it was a it was, a, it, you know, it was different than the other two movies. But. The Japanese distributor who made up a a large part of the funding of the film would not agree to fund it with a black lead. Um, This became a I didn't know this, but in Japan, it it was considered at least at that time that a black uh, um, leading man um, doesn't relate to the audience in Japan. I'm sure that's all changed today. I know it's got to have changed today. But back then, that was the thinking. And um, so 
ultimately we're in pre-production money is being spent you know we're casting as the script indicates and the funding company came to me this was overseas film group and they said the japanese are not going to sign the agreement and i said oh god they said is there any way we could put robert davi in here so i called to find robert davi's availability as it turns out he was available and I said, Robert Davi's available. And so when we put Robert Davi in the movie, we now had a square peg in a round hole mm-hmm. because what was in the movie did not relate in any way to Robert Davi. So it was already a, it was a it was a before the cameras rolled, I knew already it was a disaster. Yeah, this thing was already not going so well. Yeah, this was. This movie was derailed. And, you know, from the from the company that's funding it, all they care, well, we got the money that we can make the movie. And, you know, <laughs> you know, let's make the movie. And yeah. then I was saddled with producers um, and, you know, they were well intended. But their job was to make the film, you know, to make a, a Maniac Cop 3 that's 90 minutes and has a beginning, middle and end. You know, mm-hmm. they didn't care. They had no stake in the series. You know, they 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 hadn't made the other two films. They, you know, they come aboard and these guys were not, they, you know, they didn't even kind of relate to the movie. Um, you know, they, again, they were smart. They were nice guys. But it was just weird to have. Now I have collaborators. And it was just and then Larry, when it came to rewriting the script, Larry's position was. I'm not going to rewrite the script unless I get paid for a new script. This is a whole new script. And he was right. I can't I can't argue with him. Yeah. So one of these producers rewrote the script. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, they weren't bad people. They were just trying to get it done. Collect their fees and move on to their next project. It just seems... Um, it, it... Actually, it doesn't seem unbelievable in a way. Hearing you explain it kind of like that, you kind of start to, a picture is kind of painted of, um, like you said, I never really thought of it like that. You know, they didn't have a stake in in the Maniac Cop franchise or this was just about, we need this movie to have a beginning, middle and end by any yeah, means the, necessary. The funding company imposed them on the on the film to protect their investment. Mm-hmm. That's all they were there for was to protect overseas film groups investment and to finish the movie for the money we had come hell or high water. And at what point for you, I know you've probably been asked these questions like a million times, but at, at what point for you were you like, I'm just, I'm done with this. I can't, I can't work it, like this. It, or I can't do this. Yeah. When they gave me the when they gave me pages, they wanted look, what happened was because we had to rip out so many pages in Larry's script, we were down to a, like a 70 page script. And so when I finished, you know, and I, I was shooting it, it became apparent that we didn't have enough scenes to, to make a 90 minute movie. So they started writing scenes to pad out the movie. And the first one I was given was the scene with um that opens the movie at the firing range Mm -hmm. and it was like this you know courtship thing i don't know how to describe it between you know between robert davi and this this woman and i just said this is ridiculous this is so fucking stupid and i read it and i go oh god and i tell the i remember sitting in the parking lot with the new pages in my hands that I was, you know, tasked to start shooting it in a little while. And I look at it and I go, this is terrible. And so I said, he came over to my car and I said, look, Joel, I don't know. I can't shoot this shit. I really can't. I mean, this is something he wrote. I'm saying that I can't shoot this. I mean, maybe you just want to shoot it yourself. And that's what he wound up doing. And was that the, his instant reaction? Just like, yeah, okay, whatever. No, no, no. I mean, you know, it was like he understood. You know, I think he understood. And uh, it was like, Joel, why don't you just shoot it? You know, what's the difference from there or not? 
And then he wound up shooting that and a few other filler <clears throat> scenes. And mostly, most of them are in the first reel of the movie. Mm-hmm. And at any point, would you have? Uh, did anybody ever approach you, maybe, to come on board and give your ideas, or maybe, or would you have? Been I was even, always. Would you? Have been I was always asked. Are you talk about a maniac cop three. Mm-hmm. I inputted a lot of ideas in it. I input, in, inputted some of the set pieces. Um, you know, they, they, again, nobody was, there's no black hat in this. There's no bad guys. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I was not offended because my enthusiasm for doing it, number one, wasn't there. And, um, and, and I just, you know, I, 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 I kind of felt like I wanted to just get it done and, and honestly collect my money and move on. Yeah, it had just gotten to that point. Yeah. Yeah. I can kind so of that's all that. I cared about doing was protecting my money. And so you come away from that then. Do you have um, a sour taste in your mouth now to get I involved think, in another I, I project? Think I, yeah, I think what happened to me, and I probably, honestly, at the time, maybe should have, I don't, I don't hope this doesn't sound crazy, but I recommend this to a filmmaker. If you're going through a period like this where you've been replaced on a project you put a lot of effort into and, um, and you know, you've, you've just come off something, a, a kind of a bad production experience, which was my first, um, you should really go and seek psychiatric help. Because at the time, I didn't realize, but I was probably in a depression. Mm-hmm. And did that kind of, I guess... I suppose that probably took over at that point. Then did it? Did your desire to to make movies yeah, well, kind of the next pro? Yeah, well, the next project <clears throat> that I was attached to was a film that was a horror show. It was a horror show. It, it was called The Expert when it got released. It, we shot it under the title Brute Force, mm-hmm. and it starred this martial arts guy who was horrendous, called Jeff Speakman. It was absolutely an horrendous film. And I shot about 75% of it, and I took my name off of it. And the rest was, you know, a lot of it was filmed by Jeff's, you know, guy. Because I just couldn't deal with the guy. I couldn't deal with Jeff Speakman. Again, I think all these things could have been, I could have helped myself had I sought maybe therapy. Would have helped me. I don't know. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. Hmm. But I was so depressed. I was so disheartened. And I probably even had a chip on my shoulder feeling, you know, like angry at the world <laughs> uh, that I wasn't, you know, really performing up to my best. And um, so at what point did that maybe start to come back or did you feel like, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel a bit maybe reinvigorated or refreshed. I want to, I want to do something again. I, I feel good about this. You know, it was funny. Uncle Sam was a project that Larry uh, presented to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and at first I kind of put it aside because I felt, well, this is a maniac cop in a different, in a different clothing. And um, in a different costume, I should say. Um, And uh, then, you know, I'm looking around and looking, you know, to get my next job going. I revisit Uncle Sam after working on this other movie in Nashville, you know, the movie The Expert. Mm -hmm. And in while I was down in Nashville, I noticed how how much enthusiasm the people in that part of the country have for 4th of July. Now, 4th of July in New York, you know, they shoot off fireworks, but there really isn't that patriotic angle to it. It's more like a holiday to barbecue and shoot fireworks. Mm -hmm. But no one takes into account the, you know, the red, white, and blue aspect, the military aspect, you know, all those things that that are really... Uh, in the, when you get outside the big cities, they they salute is all these 
patriotic things during Fourth of July. So I started to see an angle for Fourth of July. Plus, I became a big fan of Twin Peaks. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if the if it was kind of a Twin Peaks type of movie? Um, you know, it has a Twin Peaks element to it, and it's called Uncle Sam. And I started it started to gel in my head. I started to get an idea for it. And um, and so, you know, I could see where I can make a movie out of this. And uh, my uh, disappointment with the movie um, is that the score on it is terrible. The, the music score. Mm -hmm. uh, the producer chose to hire someone. You know, I like working with Jay Chataway. You know, but if Ennio Morricone would agree to do a score, I'd work with Ennio Morricone in a heartbeat. But the producer, for reasons to this day, I still don't understand, hired some guy to do the music and insisted on him over Jay Chataway. And the music, when it came in, was terrible. It was awful. And we had to butcher it and... I brought in a music editor. We did all this stuff to try to repair it. We started buying music from music libraries. It was just a mess. And, um, and, and I really saw how much music or lack thereof can hurt a, a movie. And yeah. that's the problem I feel with Uncle Sam's. That's another movie that, just in my opinion, I feel like it's very overlooked and... Look, I know it probably has some flaws and those are not really for me to to speak on because mm -hmm. I, I don't have experience in that. Um, but I felt like the, I mean, the acting and the characters were, were um, in, in my opinion, were very good. And the camera work was very fluid. And um, that image of the Uncle Sam on the stilts. Um, yeah. That like, and hobbling away like that. Yeah. That even haunts no. me when I think about it now. I had dreams about that for years. Um, well, I got to tell you, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of good things in Uncle Sam. I'm not going to call it a it was it, to me. It was disappointing because I think I know it could not think I know it could have been a much better picture mm -hmm. with a proper score. Yeah. And as it is, it, 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 it just falls into blah for me. You know, there are some scenes that I like and some things even with the score kind of works. But it was just um, it's just too disappointing. You know, I wanted a, you know, you know, the things I like, there's some good camera work. You're right. I think there is. I think there's some good scenes. The one with the stilts, I agree. Is, I think that was kind of outstanding. Um, I love the shot of looking over his shoulder and seeing the naked girl mm -hmm. and the camera pulls back all the way to the ground and you see him on the stilts. I always love that shot. Yeah. There's, there, um, there's definitely, there's, there's some great things in there. And I don't know if you'd agree with this, but to me, it kind of, um, I mean, in a time where people were just looking to do a lot of slasher ripoffs and just, just make a slasher movie because this kind of felt like it had more of a heartbeat or like you said, like it didn't turn out exactly as maybe you would have wished it had, but it definitely <laughs> felt like it had, because uh, I rewatched it again recently and it definitely feel like it, it, I don't know, it had just something, something more than, oh, this is another 90s slasher movie or another 90s kind of generic. Well, I mean, that's that's the beauty when you have a, a writer like Larry Cohen, because he comes up with original ideas, you know, mm -hmm. within the genre. He'll come up with some original ideas. Um, but, um, you know, I. I you know, I, I think back to the movie and, and that's the, the part, you know, that I think about. I, I, it's sore for me. It's a sore subject because I really felt I was stabbed in the back about the, uh, you know, about that. But, you know, you, you move on. And, you know, and then I kind of from there kind of fell into the video business. <laughs> yeah. That, so that's what I was going to ask about. Did did maybe all those experiences kind of one after another kind of make you think I, I want to move to do something, try something different in my career now. 
You know, I always believe serendipity rules. So I, there's never a time where I say, this is what I'm going to do, or this is why I'm doing this, or this is, I just take opportunities as they come. Yeah. And some I accept, some I, I reject, some I regret rejecting, some I regret accepting. But the point is, I can never plot out my, quote, career. I never had a career. It was, to me, a career is something that you plan. Yeah. I had no plan. You know? Yeah. I went with the flow. Uh, yeah, and Whatever. I guess it can have its pros and its cons. Yeah, but that's how I look at it. And I always thought I, I always thought the video business was going to be temporary. I always thought there would be a movie around the corner that I'd want to do. But suddenly DVD exploded and I was right there in its infancy. Yeah, because you, you had done um, – you worked with Anchor Bay, right? Yes. And like you, you've done, um, you know, documentaries and, and different things for Halloween, Deep Red, Inferno – Manhunter, Suspiria, Wicker Man, like yeah. some huge, huge titles. So you must have been pretty, um, I guess, busy. I was. I was very active. And the money was good. And I was active. And uh, I was, um, you know, I was enjoying it. But I didn't know where it was going to go. I didn't know Blu-ray was around the corner. I didn't know. I didn't know Anchor Bay would get sold and I would start my own video label. Mm-hmm. It's just a way, you know, uh, it's it's just, again, serendipity rules. I just kind of went with the flow and I was the first guy in. So I was licensing a lot of really cool titles and um, it was an exciting period. And did maybe the idea of directing and stuff kind of go away then when you got so busy and things were really picking well, the, up? The funny part is, is I... Um, I, I, yes, the, I don't, th- it never went away. I mean, I was always in my mind, a director at that time, mm-hmm. but when we were producing all these documentaries and I had other directors on them, I would collaborate and, you know, I'd get in the editing room with them and go over it and say, Hey, what if we try that? You know? And I always felt I was, you know, I was creative. I was, I was feeling you know, that I wasn't giving up my creativity. And again, there wasn't like this great script in front of me that I wanted to make. Yeah, because I always, people always give me questions to ask and stuff. And I think, and I probably felt like this before I, I started to talk to people like yourself. Um, I think sometimes people assume, oh, well, if you're a director and, and I'm sure this has probably happened to you where you've maybe been offered certain projects that are, probably some big name titles you know for movies or franchises or whatever and you turn them down because it just doesn't feel right or your heart is not in the script a lot of people i think like a regular fan might think that oh well of course you're going to agree to every movie of course you're going to agree to that name and it's like it's that's not always the case well i did do that with in the case of Doing Maniac Cop 3, doing The Expert, doing uh, um, to some degree, not really with Uncle Sam, but I kind of felt with these, with at least those two projects, I was doing it and accepting it only for the money. Mm hmm. That was all that was on my mind, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. and you, and one thing I could I, I could tell any aspiring filmmaker or anybody creative or otherwise don't do anything for the money because it never works out. You may get the money, but as far as the project being something you'll be proud of, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> just doesn't. And, uh, and, and I started doing that. And, and that's another reason why I was kind of grateful that DVD got me out of it. Yeah. Cause I would have accepted other things that I would regret. And that that was actually going to be a question that I was going to ask is um, if you could offer advice to not even necessarily um, sometimes I hate being kind of, a, you know, pigeonhole somebody and go, what advice would you give to a director? Because you've been multiple things throughout your life. I mean, like you said, you've branched off and you, you, you started your own company and, and you got your own stuff going on. What advice would you give to somebody who maybe 
is looking to be in the movie industry um, or or in any creative industry, I guess, that doesn't necessarily want the nine to five? Number one, if they're even considering a nine to five, forget it. Don't, I mean, if that's like they're saying, well, I want to be a director or I want to go work, at, you know, at IBM or something, I don't know, or at Apple. Um, the thing is, is you got to feel as though you have no other option. That this is it. Do or die. I want to be a director. Mm -hmm. This is what I want to do. That's the only thing I want to do. And I can't think of myself doing anything else. And I will tell you the common denominator among directors mm -hmm. is starting young. Mm -hmm. You can't, I mean, I guess you can, but it's rare that someone moves into directing when they're much older than 30. Yeah. You really got to get out there when you're young. And as I say, you're fearless. So, you, you know, can make that, mistakes. That's, you, well, you're not thinking you're making mistakes, but you're fearless because, you know, I'm going to do this no matter what, you know, yeah, I'm going to make this thing happen. I don't care if I got to rob somebody to make to, to make payroll that week, you know, to get the get the movie made. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to do whatever you got to do. And, uh, you know, I, I, I it's the way it is. You know, you've got to start young when you when you don't have responsibility, when you're not out on your own and you've got rent to pay and you've got a girlfriend and your your girlfriend wants to have a baby, you know, then you're fucked. Yeah, it starts to overcomplicate everything. <laughs> you're totally fucked because on your first one or two projects, it's unlikely you'll ever make any money from them. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean they're unsuccessful. It's just you probably sold your soul to make the movie. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so how are you going to justify that when your girlfriend's at home wondering why you're not bringing home any money? Yeah, it's true. It's it's true. And it's and and I definitely do agree with um what you said about the fact that if somebody's considering another option, uh, I think I had heard I'm not sure if it was Arnold Schwarzenegger has a famous speech where he talks about um somebody asks him about advice for the career in, in film. And he says, um, anybody that says to me, okay, so I've got plan A and plan B is, he's like that person. No, there is no plan B. I just have this one dream, this one goal. It has to be that or nothing else. Well, I happen to agree with Arnold. Yeah. It, it's, I, I, it's, you know, yeah, it's an obsession. You'll you'll probably alienate people with your obsession, you know, because they'll wonder if you're nuts. Mm -hmm. But that's it. I mean, my family thought I was completely nuts. You, you think you're going to make movies? <laughs> you know, why don't you go work? You know, in in my in, in my company's business. How did you get over that? Um, when when that's something that even I deal with, but a lot of people message me and stuff and, and say they're dealing with that. They have this dream or this idea to do something and everybody thinks they're fucking batshit crazy or, you know, maybe the girlfriend leaves them or the boyfriend leaves them or just whatever mm -hmm. it might be. Family thinks you're absolutely crazy for having this dream. How did you push past that and not let that get into your mind and control? I everything? just ignored it. It wasn't, I, I, it wasn't anything. I mean, nobody sat me down and said, you're crazy, all this. But it was clear that my ambition far exceeded what people's expectations were of me. And just remember, it's a lot of fun later when you can gloat yeah. about what you've accomplished. Yeah. I like that you're, um, that you're transparent about that, that it feels good to be able to look back and see the success and see you proved yourself right. Yeah, you know, they all look like, huh? <laughs> he did that. <laughs> um, what would you say your favorite, your favorite, uh, either movie or something that you've worked on throughout your life? What, what is there anything that sticks out in memory or? I would say the highlight of my life was Maniac Cop Two. Yeah, that was the highlight of my of my life. I, I really, really enjoyed working on that. Was it hard? Yeah. Was there periods I wanted to 
I wanted to die, yeah. But it was like, it was the best war that I ever fought. Let me put it to you that way. Because each movie is a war. Yeah. And that was the best, that was the most fun, was fighting that war. And uh, is there anything maybe throughout your life that you wanted to do that you didn't get a chance to or would you still think about? Hmm. Was there any particular movie well, or anything that you had wanted? There was a girl I met um, and we just re- we just re- became reacquainted over Facebook and I'm sorry I didn't marry her. <laughs> but, and the- Oh, uh, is that something that was um, obviously uh, you don't have to answer any of this if it's too personal. But was that something that um, maybe your your job got in the way of or because you had mentioned it being an obsession and I hear about a lot of people losing relationships or maybe yeah. houses and marriages and things because they are so focused on this dream. Yeah, clearly the business got in the way. Yeah. And uh yeah, but it was, uh, yeah, she was the one for me. And I, uh, you know, because she, in the end, is somebody who got me, understood me. Mm-hmm. And uh, I miss her. And it's, uh, you know, but anyway, that's life. At least we got re- we got reacquainted. Yeah, well, that's good. And it, it's nice to hear you be kind of um, transparent about that, because I know there's a lot of people who probably feel like that about certain things. Um, Mm -hmm. you know other aspects of life kind of pass you by maybe or something happens and and uh you only realize it afterwards um so if you could pick a few movies what would you say some of your favorite horror movies are or is there anything that jumps out well jumps out at me favorites i mean texas chainsaw massacre Mm -hmm. uh carnival of souls i love that movie um you don't know the film? No, I love that movie. Yeah, I yeah, love it too. I love that. Um, I, uh, Psycho, of course. Mm-hmm. Halloween. Um, uh, I think Halloween, I mean, it really, really holds up. It's yeah. so well made. So well made. Um, uh, let me see. Um, I like the original Saw a whole lot. I thought that was really good. Mm-hmm. Um and then there were some, you know, films like Let the right, the right One In. I thought it was terrific. Uh, I know there was a, oh, here's a recent horror film I thought was really good called Hounds of Love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Australian movie. Boy, that was good. Do you keep up with with movies or horror movies absolutely. now? Absolutely. Yeah. You still oh, absolutely. Up? Yeah. Um, absolutely. So this was a question that somebody had messaged me in to ask you, and it was, if you could direct any existing horror IP, what would you choose and why? Huh. Um, that's a very good question. I wish I had time to think about it because I, I know there's probably something that I've seen that I wish I had. I guess this means I wish I had made it. Yeah, like I, I assume what they mean here is, is there a, yeah. a franchise or something that you would have loved to have given a go at or or whatever? I can't, I can't think of a franchise. I could only think of, let me think of an individual film. God, probably if I was to dive into my, my uh, oh God, that I really, really loved. We can um, we can come back around to that one. I just have a couple yeah. more questions before I uh, okay. before I let you go. You're going to edit this, right? So yeah. I don't sound like I'm such a. Oh, you're fine. <laughs> yes. Um. So Maniac Cop, I heard, is getting a remake sequel. It's getting actually a TV series. Oh. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's being funded by HBO and Studio Canal. And um, uh, Nicholas Winding Refn mm-hmm. um, is a producer, and um, he's also going to direct episodes. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, that's. Uh, Are you involved in the project? Well, it's going to say executive producer, and it's going to say produced in association with Blue Underground, but it's really Nick's uh, baby. 
Okay. You know, I, you can't have too many chefs in the kitchen. Yeah. And so it's better. It's better. Nick makes. You know, does it on his own. Would you um, come back maybe and direct an episode for all time's sake or something? You know, if I'm asked, that yeah. might be fun. That might, be, yeah, that I, would be I fun. That actually, would be fun a, I didn't, I didn't cool actually nod. think about that. Because I assumed yeah. I, I, straight away when I had seen it, because um, I wasn't sure if if the TV show was actually the the route that it was taken. But um, my first thought was it would be super cool to see you maybe direct the first episode or something like that at some point in the show. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. I, I, I'm i going to give it some thought. Uh, but yeah, I agree. I would love to do it. How how does it feel to, to look at something that you, I mean, you were uh, a, a huge part in, in making this what it is now, to see it kind of come full circle again and, you know, it's getting a, a TV show in 2021, 2022. Well, I'm. I, I feel amazed. Um, I feel amazed that it that it um, you know that it's come around. Mm-hmm. It, it's there's definitely, and when I heard this, there's definitely. I think seeing the success that even your movies still have, you know, twenty thirty years later, to a, a younger audience like myself and younger again, there's definitely room there. I think to reintroduce some of these movies. If it's done in the right way, whether yeah. whether it be a, a reboot or a, a reimagining or whatever you want to call it, there's definitely room there, I think, for the core idea to be modernized and kind of brought back into the younger group. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it's going to be exciting to see that, to see that come out. Um, okay, so final things then. Uh, why horror and what does it mean to you? It means that the audience reacts viscerally. It's not an intellectual experience. Mm-hmm. It's an it's a pure emotional experience. I would say it's the, the other side of the coin of comedy. Yeah. And um, and when people ask me, you know, what's horror? What's you know, what's horrific? What's what makes a horror film? I can never really articulate it because I don't know. It just feels right. You know, Mm -hmm. horror is very personal. That's why the directors of horror films tend to be, um, you know, noted auteurs. Yeah. You know, versus somebody who does drama. Yeah. It's uh, the, the horror guys tend to have celebrity. Yeah. Yeah. That makes it, and it was something I I always talk about with people as well. Um, the horror community is, in in my opinion, anyway, it, it's probably more unique than any of the communities out there. Um, and especially for film, like there's such diehard fans, and they support projects like till till the bitter end. Really, I mean, you know, there's there's a huge following out there for things like Maniac Cop now, even still, all this time later it still has such a solid fan base. Uh-huh. And I'm not well, sure it's... you get that all the time. Not, you know, it's, it's, it, I, I know I, when I travel to Europe, I, I was recently, recently a year and a half ago, I was in Berlin mm-hmm. and I could see, you know, the success of Maniac Cop, that there was people there who were excited. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, it's it's uh, um, you know it's it's very gratifying. Yeah, it, it must be nice, and, and and it's nice as well to see people get recognition for their work. Um, so I guess last thing then really is what what's the future look like for you, or is there anything you're excited about, or you want to get involved in, or you're currently doing? Well, I'm excited about the upcoming Blue Underground releases mm-hmm. of um, of uh, a Final Countdown, and even more about Dead and Buried, mm-hmm. uh, the Gary Sherman movie. Um, the Dead and Buried is interesting because that producing the master uh, 4K master on Dead and Buried was a three year ordeal, <laughs> maybe Already. longer if you yeah. Maybe longer, you know, the search of materials on that movie 
it's terrible, terrible, terrible that uh, the materials on that film were so difficult to find. And um, I guess that that that's probably your work going forward is is a lot of Blue Underground and how much how much of your time does something like that take up? Because obviously it's kind of taken off now. I mean. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's I, I can't say it monopolizes every one of my days, but, you know, when something comes up, I do have to go into the to the labs and get on the phone to Europe and, you know, all this. Um, I'm right now getting the materials in for Goodbye Uncle Tom, oh, wow. which we're going to do 4K and, and it's a lot of a lot of work involved. That must be fun but for you as a movie fan. Yeah, you know, it is definitely the most fun of doing those featurettes. By the way, we're meeting people that, but for those featurettes, I never would have met. I never would have met Christopher Lee, uh, you know, uh, Roy Ward Baker. Uh, I can't go on and on of all the people that I got to meet through doing those featurettes. Or uh, you know, it was uh, it was a great experience. Yeah, it's it, and it's you know what as well. It's really nice to see that. Um, I know a lot of people feel like physical media is dying, and while it may be in the sense of mainstream, um, you know, you may not be able to go to Target or whatever at some point in the future and pick up these things. I do think things like what you're doing, you're not only selling, you know, your movie and your physical thing. It's to me, it's like a, a sense of nostalgia as well. You're kind of selling uh, more than just a, you know, a Blu-ray or a 4K. It's, it's I guess, a collector's item, but it's also a, a capsule in time, really. Well, I look at it, yeah, I, I can see that. I look at it as this. The films that I choose to put out have a, a fan base to some degree, Mm-hmm. And um, and I look at it as giving the um, the collector um, the definitive version of that particular movie with as many bonus extras that we could muster up based on people being alive or willing to do interviews. You know, that's that's what I try to do. And I really don't spare any expense in doing it. Yeah, and you can really feel that. And as somebody who collects movies, um, I'm loving this reemergence that there's a few, uh, a few select companies um, like yourself that are that are putting out these things that are, um, I mean, in my opinion, without and a lot of people are probably saying, "No, oh, shut up," but I feel like that. You, I mean, you could charge probably double the money because a lot of these are packed with things that we would never have dreamt. Of having as extras. Well, I mean, we raised the SRPs uh, of the of the four Ks to uh, roughly sixty dollars, mm-hmm. uh, and I think that's a, a fair price mm-hmm. on these, given the size of the market and the potential sales. Um, you know, without having raised the price, we would almost certainly lose money. Yeah, yeah, for what's being put in, yeah, a hundred percent, I could see that. Um, well, that's kind of it. Um, we 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 might come back to if if you do think of something that uh, you would have liked to have directed or been involved in. Um, oh yeah, maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll uh, I'll text you. Yeah, and we can we can put it up on Instagram or something somewhere. I'll post it. Um, okay. On my website. Um, Good. That sounds like fun. I uh, I appreciate you taking the time because I know you're probably got a lot going on and it was quite early over there. No, Sunday I'm completely dead. There's no workers. Um, but it was great to talk at, to you. At my apartment. Yeah, they all today's their day off. Oh, really? That's why I chose Sunday to do this. That makes sense. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, my pleasure. It's been absolutely great to talk to you. Um, I will put the links for everything down below. So anybody who's listening to this episode, um, the links for Blue Underground and stuff will be all down below. Anywhere you get podcasts. And I um, just want to thank everyone for listening. Hey, thank you. And thank, uh, well, thank you, audience, for listening. Mm-hmm. 
Support First Class Horror on Patreon for as little as $1. Can't get enough of the horror? Carve yourself a deal from official merchandise only on Teespring. Join us on all social media at First Class Horror. We have such sights to show you.